THE LAND THAT TIME FORGOT by Edgar Rice Burroughs Chapter 3 Those were anxious days, during which I had but little opportunity to associate with Lys. I had given her the commander's room, Bradley and I taking that of the deck officer, while Olson and two of our best men occupied the room ordinarily allotted to petty officers. I made Nobbs bed down in Lys's room, for I knew she would feel less alone. Nothing of much moment occurred for a while after we left British waters behind us. We ran steadily along upon the surface, making good time. The first two boats we sighted made off as fast as they could go, and the third a huge freighter fired on us, forcing us to submerge. It was after this that our troubles commenced. One of the diesel engines broke down in the morning, and while we were working on it the forward port diving tank commenced to fill. I was on deck at the time and noted the gradual list. Guessing at once what was happening, I leaped for the hatch, and slamming it closed above my head, dropped to the centrail. By this time the craft was going down by the head with a most unpleasant list to port, and I didn't wait to transmit orders to someone else, but ran as fast as I could for the valve that let the sea into the forward port diving tank. It was wide open. To close it and to have the pump started that would empty it were the work of but a minute, but we had had a close call. I knew that the valve had never opened itself. Someone had opened it, someone who was willing to die himself if he might at the same time encompass the death of all of us. After that I kept a guard pacing the length of the narrow craft. We worked upon the engine all that day and night and half the following day. Most of the time we drifted idly upon the surface, but toward noon we sighted smoke due west, and having found that only enemies inhabited the world for us, I ordered that the other engine be started so that we could move out of the path of the oncoming steamer. The moment the engine started to turn, however, there was a grinding sound of tortured steel, and when it had been stopped we found that someone had placed a cold chisel in one of the gears. It was another two days before we were ready to limp along half-repaired. The night before the repairs were completed, the sentry came to my room and awoke me. He was rather an intelligent fellow of the English middle class, in whom I had much confidence. "'Well, Wilson,' I asked, "'what's the matter now?' He raised his finger to his lips and came closer to me. "'I think I've found out who's doing the mischief,' he whispered, and nodded his head toward the girl's room. "'I seen her sneakin' from the crew's room just now,' he went on. "'She'd been in gassin' with the bush, Commander. "'Benson seen her in there last night, too. "'But he never said nothin' till I goes on watch tonight. "'Benson's sort of slow in the head, "'and he never puts two and two together "'till someone else has made four of it.' "'If the man had come in and struck me suddenly in the face, "'I could have been no more surprised. "'Say nothing of this to anyone,' I ordered. Keep your eyes and ears open, and report every suspicious thing you see or hear. The man saluted and left me, but for an hour or more I tossed restless upon my hard bunk in an agony of jealousy and fear. Finally I fell into a troubled sleep. It was daylight when I awoke. We were steaming along slowly upon the surface, my orders having been to proceed at half speed until we could take an observation and determine our position. The sky had been overcast all the previous day and all night, but as I stepped into the centrail that morning I was delighted to see that the sun was again shining. The spirits of the men seemed improved. Everything seemed propitious. I forgot at once the cruel misgivings of the past night as I set to work to take my observations. What a blow awaited me! The sextant and chronometer had both been broken beyond repair, and they had been broken just this very night. They had been broken upon the night that Lys had been seen talking with von Schoenvorts. I think that it was this last thought which hurt me the worst. I could look the other disaster in the face with equanimity, 
but the bald fact that Lys might be a traitor appalled me. I called Bradley and Olson on deck and told them what had happened, but for the life of me I couldn't bring myself to repeat what Wilson had reported to me the previous night. In fact, as I had given the matter thought, it seemed incredible that the girl could have passed through my room, in which Bradley and I slept, and then carried on a conversation in the crew's room, in which von Schoenwurz was kept without having been seen by more than a single man. Bradley shook his head. "'I can't make it out,' he said. "'One of those boches must be pretty clever to come it over us all like this. But they haven't harmed us as much as they think. There are still the extra instruments.' It was my turn now to shake a doleful head. "'There are no extra instruments,' I told them. "'They, too, have disappeared, as did the wireless apparatus.' Both men looked at me in amazement. "'We still have the compass and the sun,' said Olson. "'They may be after getting the compass some night, but there's too many of us around in the daytime for em to get the sun.' It was then that one of the men stuck his head up through the hatchway, and seeing me asked permission to come on deck and get a breath of fresh air. I recognized him as Benson, the man who Wilson had said reported having seen Lys with von Schoenborgs two nights before. I motioned him on deck, and then called him to one side, asking if he had seen anything out of the way or unusual during his trick on watch the night before. The fellow scratched his head a moment and said, No, and then, as though it was an afterthought, he told me that he had seen the girl in the crew's room about midnight talking with the German commander, but as there hadn't seemed to him to be any harm in that, he hadn't said anything about it. Telling him never to fail to report to me anything in the slightest out of the ordinary routine of the ship, I dismissed him. Several of the other men now asked permission to come on deck, and soon all but those actually engaged in some necessary duty were standing around smoking and talking, all in the best of spirits. I took advantage of the absence of the man upon the deck to go below for my breakfast, which the cook was already preparing upon the electric stove. Lys, followed by Nobs, appeared as I entered the Centrail. She met me with a pleasant, "'Good morning,' which I am afraid I replied to in a tone that was rather constrained and surly. "'Would you breakfast with me?' I suddenly asked the girl." determined to commence a probe of my own along the lines which duty demanded. She nodded a sweet acceptance of my invitation, and together we sat down at the little table of the officer's mess. "'You slept well last night?' I asked. "'All night,' she replied. "'I am a splendid sleeper.' Her manner was so straightforward and honest that I could not bring myself to believe in her duplicity." Yet, thinking to surprise her into a betrayal of her guilt, I blurted out, The chronometer and sextant were both destroyed last night. There is a traitor among us. But she never turned a hair by way of evidencing guilty knowledge of the catastrophe. Who could it have been? she cried. The Germans would be crazy to do it, for their lives are as much at stake as ours. Men are often glad to die for an ideal, an ideal of patriotism, perhaps, I replied, and a willingness to martyr themselves includes a willingness to sacrifice others, even those who love them. Women are much the same, except that they will go even further than most men. They will sacrifice everything, even honor, for love. I watched her face carefully as I spoke and I thought that I detected a very faint flush mounting her cheek. Seeing an opening and an advantage, I sought to follow it up. Take von Schoenberts, for instance, I continued. He would doubtless be glad to die and take us all with him, could he prevent in no other way the falling of his vessel into enemy hands. He would sacrifice anyone, even you, and if you still love him, you might be his ready tool. Do you understand me? She looked at me in wide-eyed consternation for a moment, and then she went very white and rose from her seat. "'I do,' she replied, and turning her back upon me she walked quickly toward her room. 
I started to follow, for even believing what I did, I was sorry that I had hurt her. I reached the door to the cruise room just behind her, and in time to see von Schoenvorts lean forward and whisper something to her as she passed. But she must have guessed that she might be watched, for she passed on. That afternoon it clouded over. The wind mounted to a gale, and the sea rose until the craft was wallowing and rolling frightfully. Nearly everyone aboard was sick. The air became foul and oppressive. For twenty-four hours I did not leave my post in the conning tower, as both Olson and Bradley were sick. Finally I found that I must get a little rest, and so I looked about for someone to relieve me. Benson volunteered. He had not been sick, and assured me that he was a former R.N. man and had been detailed for submarine duty for over two years. I was glad that it was he, for I had considerable confidence in his loyalty, and so it was with a feeling of security that I went below and lay down. I slept twelve hours straight, and when I awoke and discovered what I had done, I lost no time in getting to the conning tower. There sat Benson as wide awake as could be, and the compass showed that we were heading straight into the west. The storm was still raging, nor did it abate its fury until the fourth day. We were all pretty well done up and looked forward to the time when we could go on deck and fill our lungs with fresh air. During the whole four days I had not seen the girl, as she evidently kept closely to her room, and during this time no untoward incident had occurred aboard the boat, a fact which seemed to strengthen the web of circumstantial evidence about her. For six more days after the storm lessened we still had fairly rough weather, nor did the sun once show himself during all that time. For the season, it was now the middle of June, the storm was unusual, but being from Southern California, I was accustomed to unusual weather. In fact, I have discovered that the world over, unusual weather prevails at all times of the year. We kept steadily to our westward course, and as the U-33 was one of the fastest submersibles we had ever turned out, I knew that we must be pretty close to the North American coast. What puzzled me most was the fact that for six days we had not sighted a single ship. It seemed remarkable that we could cross the Atlantic almost to the coast of the American continent without glimpsing smoke or sail, and at last I came to the conclusion that we were way off our course, but whether to the north or to the south of it I could not determine. On the seventh day the sea lay comparatively calm at early dawn. There was a slight haze upon the ocean which had cut off our view of the stars, but conditions all pointed toward a clear morrow, and I was on deck anxiously awaiting the rising of the sun. My eyes were glued upon the impenetrable mist astern, for there in the east I should see the first glow of the rising sun that would assure me we were still upon the right course. Gradually the heavens lightened, but astern I could see no intenser glow that would indicate the rising sun behind the mist. Bradley was standing at my side. Presently he touched my arm. "'Look, Compton,' he said, and pointed south. I looked and gasped for there, directly to port, I saw outlined through the haze the red top of the rising sun. Hurrying to the tower, I looked at the compass. It showed that we were holding steadily upon our westward course. Either the sun was rising in the south, or the compass had been tampered with. The conclusion was obvious. I went back to Bradley and told him what I had discovered. And, I concluded, we can't make another five hundred knots without oil. Our provisions are running low, and so is our water. God only knows how far south we have run. There is nothing to do, he replied, other than to alter our course once more toward the west. We must raise land soon, or we shall all be lost. I told him to do so and then I set to work improvising a crude sextant with which we finally took our bearings in a rough and most unsatisfactory manner 
for when the work was done we did not know how far from the truth the result might be. It showed us to be about twenty minutes north and thirty minutes west, nearly twenty-five hundred miles off our course. In short, if our reading was anywhere near correct, we must have been traveling due south for six days. Bradley now relieved Benson, for we had arranged our shifts so that the latter and Olson now divided the nights, while Bradley and I alternated with one another during the days. I questioned both Olson and Benson closely in the matter of the compass, but each stoutly maintained that no one had tampered with it during his tour of duty. Benson gave me a knowing smile, as much as to say, Well, you and I know who did this. Yet I could not believe that it was the girl. We kept to our westerly course for several hours, when the lookout's cry announced a sail. I ordered the U-33's course altered, and we bore down upon the stranger, for I had come to a decision which was a result of necessity. We could not lie there in the middle of the Atlantic and starve to death if there was any way out of it. The sailing ship saw us while we were still a long way off, as was evidenced by her efforts to escape. There was scarcely any wind, however, and her case was hopeless. So when we drew near and signaled her to stop, she came into the wind and lay there with her sails flapping idly. We moved in quite close to her. She was the Balman of Holmstad, Sweden, with a general cargo from Brazil for Spain. I explained our circumstances to her skipper and asked for food, water, and oil. But when he found that we were not German, he became very angry and abusive and started to draw away from us. But I was in no mood for any such business. Turning toward Bradley, who was in the conning tower, I snapped out, "'Gun service on deck to the diving stations.' We had no opportunity for drill, but every man had been posted as to his duties, and the German members of the crew understood that it was obedience or death for them, as each was accompanied by a man with a pistol. Most of them, though, were only too glad to obey me. Bradley passed the order down into the ship, and a moment later the gun crew clambered up the narrow ladder and at my direction trained their piece upon the slow-moving Swede. "'Fire a shot across her bow,' I instructed the gun captain. Except it from me, it didn't take that Swede long to see the error of his way and get the red and white pennant signifying, I understand, to the masthead. Once again the sails flapped idly, and then I ordered him to lower a boat and come after me. With Olson and a couple of Englishmen, I boarded the ship and from her cargo selected what we needed, oil, provisions, and water. I gave the master of the ballman a receipt for what we took together with an affidavit signed by Bradley Olson and myself, stating briefly how we had come into possession of the U-33 and the urgency of our need for what we took. We addressed both to any British agent with the request that the owners of the Balman be reimbursed, but whether or not they were, I do not know. Note, Late in July 1916, an item in the shipping news mentioned a Swedish sailing vessel, Balman, Rey de Janeiro, to Barcelona, sunk, by a German raider sometime in June. A single survivor in an open boat was picked up off the Cape Verde Islands in a dying condition. He expired without giving any details. With water, food, and oil aboard, we felt that we had obtained a new lease of life. Now, too, we knew definitely where we were, and I determined to make for Georgetown, British Guiana, but I was destined to again suffer bitter disappointment. Six of us of the loyal crew had come on deck either to serve the gun or board the Swede during our set-to with her, and now, one by one, we descended the ladder into the Centrail. I was the last to come, and when I reached the bottom I found myself looking into the muzzle of a pistol in the hands of Baron Friedrich von Schoenvorts. I saw all my men lined up at one side, with the remaining eight Germans standing guard over them. I couldn't imagine how it had happened, but it had. Later I learned that they had first overpowered Benson, who was asleep in his bunk, 
and taken his pistol from him, and then had found it an easy matter to disarm the cook and the remaining two Englishmen below. After that it had been comparatively simple to stand at the foot of the ladder and arrest each individual as he descended. The first thing von Schoenwurtz did was to send for me and announce that, as a pirate, I was to be shot early the next morning. Then he explained that the U-33 would cruise in these waters for a time, sinking neutral and enemy shipping indiscriminately, and looking for one of the German raiders that was supposed to be in these parts. He didn't shoot me the next morning, as he had promised, and it has never been clear to me why he postponed the execution of my sentence. Instead, he kept me ironed just as he had been. Then he kicked Bradley out of my room and took it all to himself. We cruised for a long time, sinking many vessels, all but one by gunfire, but we did not come across a German raider. I was surprised to note that von Schoenwurtz often permitted Benson to take command, but I reconciled this by the fact that Benson appeared to know more of the duties of a submarine commander than did any of the stupid Germans. Once or twice Lys passed me, but for the most part she kept to her room. The first time she hesitated as though she wished to speak to me, but I did not raise my head, and finally she passed on. Then one day came the word that we were about to round the horn, and that von Schoenwurz had taken it into his fool head to cruise up along the Pacific coast of North America and prey upon all sorts and conditions of merchantmen. "'I'll put the fear of God and the Kaiser into them,' he said. The very first day we entered the South Pacific we had an adventure. It turned out to be quite the most exciting adventure I had ever encountered. It fell about this way. About eight bells of the forenoon watch I heard a hail from the deck, and presently the footsteps of the entire ship's company, from the amount of noise I heard at the ladder. Someone yelled back to those who had not yet reached the level of the deck, "'It's the raider, the German raider Geyer!' I saw that we had reached the end of our rope. Below all was quiet, not a man remained. A door opened at the end of the narrow hull, and presently Nobbs came trotting up to me. He licked my face and rolled over on his back, reaching for me with his big awkward paws. Then other footsteps sounded, approaching me. I knew whose they were, and I looked straight down at the flooring. The girl was coming almost at a run. She was at my side immediately. Here, she cried, quick, and she slipped something into my hand. It was a key, the key to my irons. At my side she also laid a pistol, and then she went on into the centrail. As she passed me I saw that she carried another pistol for herself. It did not take me long to liberate myself, and then I was at her side. How can I thank you, I started, but she shut me up with a word. Do not thank me she said coldly. I do not care to hear your thanks or any other expression from you. Do not stand there looking at me. I have given you a chance to do something. Now do it. The last was a peremptory command that made me jump. Glancing up, I saw that the tower was empty, and I lost no time in clambering up, looking about me. About a hundred yards off lay a small, swift cruiser raider, and above her floated the German man-of-war's flag. A boat had just been lowered, and I could see it moving toward us filled with officers and men. The cruiser lay dead ahead. My, I thought, what a wonderful tart! I stopped even thinking, so surprised and shocked was I by the boldness of my imagery. The girl was just below me. I looked down on her wistfully. Could I trust her? Why had she released me at this moment? I must, I must, there was no other way. I dropped back below. Ask Olson to step down here, please, I requested, and don't let anyone see you ask him. She looked at me with a puzzled expression on her face for the barest fraction of a second, and then she turned and went up the ladder. A moment later Olson returned, and the girl followed him. Quick, I whispered to the big Irishman, 
and made for the bow compartment where the torpedo tubes are built into the boat. Here, too, were the torpedoes. The girl accompanied us, and when she saw the thing I had in mind, she stepped forward and lent a hand to the swinging of the great cylinder of death and destruction into the mouth of its tube. With oil and main strength we shoved the torpedo home and shut the tube. Then I ran back to the conning tower, praying in my heart of hearts that the U-33 had not swung her bow away from the prey. No, thank God. Never could aim have been truer. I signaled back to Olson. Let her go! The U-33 trembled from stem to stern as the torpedo shot from its tube. I saw the white wake leap from her bow straight toward the enemy cruiser. A chorus of hoarse yells arose from the deck of our own craft. I saw the officer stand suddenly erect in the boat that was approaching us, and I heard loud cries and curses from the raider. Then I turned my attention to my own business. Most of the men on the submarine's deck were standing in paralyzed fascination, staring at the torpedo. Bradley happened to be looking toward the conning tower and saw me. I sprang on deck and ran toward him. Quick, I whispered, while they are stunned, we must overcome them. A German was standing near Bradley, just in front of him. The Englishman struck the fellow a frantic blow upon the neck and at the same time snatched his pistol from its holster. Von Schoenvorts had recovered from his first surprise quickly and had turned toward the main hatch to investigate. I covered him with my revolver, and at the same instant the torpedo struck the raider, the terrific explosion drowning the German's command to his men. Bradley was now running from one to another of our men, and though some of the Germans saw and heard him, they seemed too stunned for action. Olsen was below, so that there were only nine of us against eight Germans, for the man Bradley had struck still lay upon the deck. Only two of us were armed, but the heart seemed to have gone out of the Boches, and they put up but half-hearted resistance. Von Schoenvorts was the worst. He was fairly frenzied with rage and chagrin, and he came charging for me like a mad bull, and as he came he discharged his pistol. If he'd stopped long enough to take aim, he might have gotten me. But his pace made him wild, so that not a shot touched me, and then we clinched and went to the deck. This left two pistols, which two of my men were quick to appropriate. The Baron was no match for me in a hand-to-hand -hand encounter, and I soon had him pinned to the deck, and the life almost choked out of him. A half hour later things had quieted down and all was much the same as before the prisoners had revolted, only we kept a much closer watch on von Schoenvorts. The gyre had sunk while we were still battling upon our deck, and afterward we had drawn away toward the north, leaving the survivors to the attention of the single boat which had been making its way toward us when Olsen launched the torpedo. I suppose the poor devils never reached land, and if they did they most probably perished on that cold and unhospitable shore, but I couldn't permit them aboard the U-33. We had all the Germans we could take care of. That evening the girl asked permission to go on deck. She said that she felt the effects of long confinement below, and I readily granted her request. I could not understand her, and I craved an opportunity to talk with her again in an effort to fathom her, and her intentions, and so I made it a point to follow her up the ladder. It was a clear, cold, beautiful night. The sea was calm except for the white water at our bow, and the two long radiating swells running far off into the distance upon either hand astern, forming a great V which our propellers filled with choppy waves. Benson was in the tower. We were bound for San Diego, and all looked well. Liz stood with a heavy blanket wrapped around her slender figure, and as I approached her she half turned toward me to see who it was. When she recognized me she immediately turned away. "'I want to thank you,' I said, "'for your bravery and loyalty. You were magnificent. I am sorry that you had reason before to think that I doubted you.' "'You did doubt me,' she replied in a level voice. 
you practically accuse me of aiding Baron von Schoenvorts. I can never forgive you. There was a great deal of finality in both her words and tone. I could not believe it, I said, and yet two of my men reported having seen you in conversation with von Schoenvorts late at night upon two separate occasions, after each of which some great damage was found done us in the morning. I didn't want to doubt you, but I carried all the responsibility of the lives of these men, of the safety of the ship, of your life and mine. I had to watch you, and I had to put you on your guard against a repetition of your madness. She was looking at me now with those great eyes of hers, very wide and round. Who told you that I spoke with Baron von Schoenvorts at night, or any other time? she asked. I cannot tell you, Lys, I replied, but it came to me from two different sources. Then two men have lied, she asserted without heat. I have not spoken to Baron von Schoenvorts other than in your presence when first we came aboard the U-33. And please, when you address me, remember that to others than my intimates I am Miss LaRue. Did you ever get slapped in the face when you least expected it? No? Well, then you do not know how I felt at that moment. I could feel the hot, red flush surging up my neck, across my cheeks, over my ears, clear to my scalp, and it made me love her all the more. It made me swear inwardly a thousand solemn oaths that I would win her. End of chapter 3